Good morning, Cedar Ridge family. We're so glad you guys are here worshiping with us today. Those of you online, glad you're joining us as well. And no, you don't need to fix your screen or adjust your monitor. Uh, I am not Greg. Uh, for those of you visiting with us last week on Easter Sunday, you saw a really tall guy preaching the sermon, and now you're seeing a really short guy preaching the sermon. Uh, that is because Greg had shoulder surgery this past Wednesday, so he's going to be out for a few weeks. Everything went well, uh, recovering well. Shoulder surgery is a really hard one to say, like really have to enunciate that. Um, so you're going to be seeing a few of us other ministers uh, champion the load for this new series that we're jumping into today called Biblical Misinformation. Uh, misinformation is content that can be misleading, uh, often incorrect, but sometimes presented as fact, uh, either intentional or unintentional. And sometimes we as Christians uh, have, a, have a tendency to uh, spread these things, uh, whether it's accurate, whether they sound true, maybe they sound right. But what we have to wrestle with is, are they biblical? Maybe it's a phrase you heard from a well-respected teacher. Uh, maybe it's a phrase your parents taught you. Maybe it's a phrase that you yourself just have a conviction about. But when examining it, it's just misinformation. So over the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at these statements that aren't necessarily biblical. Statements like, God just wants you to be happy. God will never give you more than you can handle. Or everything happens for a reason. Sometimes we have to ask ourselves, does the Bible really say that? Today we're going to look at the phrase, follow your heart, or listen to your heart. And I don't know if you're like me, but as those words come out of my mouth, as they come off my tongue, the 1988 song, Listen to Your Heart, comes to mind. Listen to your heart when he's calling for you. Listen to your heart. There's nothing else you can do. Well, actually there is. There is something else you can do. And that's what we're going to talk about this morning. But before we go there, let's just set the scene of what this looks like in our culture and in our society today. On Monday nights, there is a particular TV show that my wife uh, enjoys watching. It's on a major network. Um, many people watch this show. Uh, they have what's called watch parties every Monday night. Uh, and depending upon, uh, well, let me just reveal this. My wife's love language is quality time. And since her love language is quality time, I watch the show with her. It's just we put the kids to bed. It's kind of our thing. It's what we do. We watch the show together. This show is known as The Bachelor or Bachelorette, depending upon what season you're in. Now, what you have a tendency to see season after season, episode after episode, no matter if the lead contestant is a guy or a girl, depending upon who they gave their rose to or who they didn't give their rose to, it's like if they didn't give their rose to someone, they have to justify it. Or if they gave their rose to someone that the rest of the, the crew didn't like, they still have to justify it. And what they end up saying is this, I'm just following my heart. I'm just doing what feels good. I'm just doing what, what the best decision that I can make. Well, let me take it one step further. Let me introduce you to a guy named Vinny. Vinny is a makeup artist and part-time model who has spent millions of dollars to achieve the look of a genderless alien. He has overgone more than 100 surgical procedures, including nipple removal, belly button removal, genital removal, forehead realignment, ear pinning, nose job, eyelid revision, jaw implants, and cheek implants. I think we have a pic of what Vinny looks like. According to the richest.com, Vinny has had 35 whole body face laser treatments, 12 cheek fillers, two brow fillers, 15 lip fillers, 10 fillers for random wrinkles, five Botox sessions, five nose procedures, one Botox under the eye, five facial peels, 20 chiro facial freezings, like dries out and tightens the skin, all to make himself look like a genderless alien. And this isn't just a 2022 type of thing that's happening right now. And I think you guys know that, but this is something where our society and our culture has been going for a number of years now. As a matter of fact, in Vinny's situation himself, many of the articles and interviews written about him happened back in 2017 when he was starting this process. And although many of us in this room might be appalled or might be shocked by what Vinny is doing, if we're being honest, if I was giving this talk and showing this picture in a TED talk or a university lecture hall or a late night talk show or entertainment tonight, anywhere other than a church setting, the crowd would be giving woos and applause right now. 
Most people that interview him commend him for what he's doing. Why? Because he's following his heart. He's doing what makes him feel good. But here's what's crazy. The source of what he's doing is not that crazy. It's not abnormal. It's not even that strange. It's actually really normal because the source of what he's doing is following his heart. And when you read articles and watch interviews about Vinny, most of the time you will hear that his friends encourage him with this, family members encourage him with this, and we're giving him the advice of you should just do what makes you feel good. If you feel like becoming a genderless alien, go for it. Follow your heart. But here's the deal. You and I are guilty of the same thing. It's just not as noticeable as Vinny. You see, we're able to get away with it a little bit better because we've all followed our feelings. We've all followed our emotions, our gut, so to speak. It's the thing that takes us in and out of jobs sometimes. It's the thing that takes us in and out of relationships sometimes. It's the thing that takes us in and out of uh, living situations or even the clothes we buy and the clothes we wear, right? If it makes me feel good, I'm going to do it. And if not, I'm going to quit. I'm not going to do it. Think about your biggest regrets in life. If you have to go back to your high school days, your college days, maybe it was something you did 20 years ago, two years ago, two months ago, two weeks ago, whatever it was. When you think about that biggest regret, it was probably because you followed your heart. You followed your desires and your wants. And look where that got you. Left you with regret and remorse. It leaves you asking, why did I do that? And if we're honest, for most of us, we just don't have a matrix to make decisions otherwise. Like it's the number one driving force in which we make decisions. Does it make me feel good? And if it does, I'm going to do it. But the Bible says something completely different. Lindsay knows that when we're watching that show together, if a contestant makes that statement, I just want to shake my head. You guys know the, the face palm emoji? Like it's one of my favorite emojis. Like it's, that's the one that makes me want to do. It's just like, oh man. Right, because I know, I know how foolish it sounds. And I know what the Bible has to say about the heart. It describes the, the, the heart as being wicked or foolish or deceitful. For those of you taking notes, here's some of the verses that talk about the heart being those things. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all else, and beyond cure, who can understand it? Mark 7, 21 and 22 says, For it is from within, out of a person's heart, that come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. Psalm 51.10 says, Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. These texts are letting us know that the heart is deceitful, that it's dirty, that from the heart comes evil and wickedness. As a matter of fact, there's a passage early on in the Gospels in John chapter 2 where it describes Jesus as not buying in to men's testimony, the testimony of men that were around him. Why? Because he knew what was in their heart. The passage goes something like this in John chapter 20. I'm going to start in verse 24 and 25. It says, but Jesus would not him trust himself to them, for he knew all people. He did not need any testimony about mankind, for he knew what was in each person. The message translation puts it this way. Jesus wasn't going to entrust his life to them because he knew them inside and out. He knows our heart. He knew their hearts. Now, some of you might uh, at this point have some emotions uh, boiling up or welling up inside you, recognizing that maybe this is a saying that you've told yourself. Maybe this is a saying that you too have bought into, and maybe this is a saying that you've also told your friends, and now you're sitting in here thinking this morning, how dare he tell me not to follow my heart? How dare he tell me what to do and what not to do? But before you get too frustrated, allow me to give us some resolve moving forward. Because no matter what camp you are in, if this is something, if this is a phrase that you have bought into and lived out and told other people, or if you're in the camp as a, as a Christian and know some of the texts that I just rattled off about the, the, the deceitfulness of the heart, but you also know the positive things that the Bible tells us to do with our heart, then there should be tension in every, one of our, in, in every one of our lives and minds and hearts this morning because here's why. What do I do with the passages of Scripture that teach me that the heart is deceitful, but yet to do things like this? 
like the greatest command in the gospel that Jesus tells us, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Wait, 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 I'm supposed to follow God with my heart? I thought, I thought my heart is evil. I thought my heart is wicked. If, it, if I'm not supposed to pursue him with the things I desire, then should I follow God with my heart? Or how about this one? Romans six seventeen says, but thanks be to God that though you used to be slaves to sin, you have come to obey from your heart. The pattern of teaching that has now claimed your allegiance. I obey with my heart? I thought my heart was wicked, deceitful above all else. How can I obey with it? Do you guys see the tension? Are you hearing it? What do we do with that? This is what theologians call a degenerate heart versus a regenerate heart. Like as Christians, when you become a follower of Christ, you receive a new spirit, a, a, a new heart, kind of a new birth, so to speak, right? It's what Paul talks about in 2 Corinthians. The old is gone, the new has come. That is your regenerate heart. This regenerate heart begins to desire the things of God. It's a transformation that takes place. And so you begin focusing on holy things, things that are different, things that are other, kind of things of the divine and God and his Holy Spirit. But also know that it's only God who transformed. This is not a man-made type of thing. God is the source of this transformation. So the question that needs to be asked moving forward is, can we trust our regenerate heart? Can we trust our regenerate heart? The short answer is yes. To dive into it a little bit more, we've got to understand that until we are with Christ, our degenerate heart will never fully be dead. Our degenerate heart will never fully be dead. You see, our new heart, our heart that desires uh, for God's spirit to fill it up is still able to be corrupted by the things of this world. It's still corruptible by the things that we engage in and that we consume in our lives. So if you fill your heart with the wrong things, what you're attracted to, how you think, it causes destructive patterns in our lives. You're always left chasing the next fleeting thing that you think is gonna fulfill your life. But if you fulfill Fill your heart with things of God, with healthy thinking, healthy living. You will find life and life abundant, like Jesus says in the scriptures. So where we're going to spend the rest of our time this morning is Proverbs chapter 4. If you have your Bible, if you have your device, go ahead and turn there. Uh, Proverbs chapter 4, many of you know, is, is written by King Solomon, the wisest guy to ever live. And the first nine chapters approximately are, are essentially like a lecture format. It's like a lecture to a young child with the, with the author having this theme of, of wisdom, of making wise choices, to value wisdom, to become wise. Listen to the Father's teachings and he will lead you to life. So I'm going to read uh, Proverbs 4. We're going to start in verse 20, verse 20 through 27. And this is going to be kind of our key passage for the morning. We're going to let this text speak over us and see what it is that we are supposed to do with our heart. So we're going to pull some truths from it today. Starting in verse 20 of chapter 4. Do not let them, uh, excuse me, my son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ears to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. Above all else, guard your heart. For everything you do flows from it. Keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the past for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot free from evil. Here's the three things we're going to talk about today in light of this text. We're going to talk about not following a guarded heart. We're going to talk about what happens if you do. And we're going to talk about how to inform our heart. But did you notice how the author starts this particular section, this particular lesson to his young child? He says, listen up, pay attention. Parents, you ever done that with your kids, right? You lean down, you want to look them in the eye, pay attention. Let's talk about this. And then midway through the passage in verse 23, he jumps into, above all else, guard your heart. Did you catch it when I read it the first time? Guard your heart. And this isn't just a catchphrase or a passage to teenage girls, high school girls, college age, or young adult girls in their dating phases, right? That's usually where we use this passage. Oh, guard your heart. No, like this is for all of us. Guard your heart. He didn't say follow your heart. 
He didn't say trust your heart. He said guard your heart. So that's point number one this morning. Don't follow an unguarded heart. So what do, what do we do with that? What, what does that look like for us? What you have to understand is that word guard in the text is literally like to guard a castle, to guard city walls. And that when nations and people would do that, they would, they would have guards stand out front or maybe like a watchtower. And as, as any enemy or outside force, evil force tried to enter, they would protect it at all costs. They would protect it with force. That is how we must guard our heart. We have to decide what comes in and what is kept out. In verse 21, he says, keep these truths or keep these teachings within your heart. You see, your heart is a truth container. And not just a truth container, it's just a container, period, for that matter. You have to assess what you are letting into it. Are you letting it be filled with truth and life? Or are you letting it be filled with lies? And I don't think we think about that often enough. What are you letting into your heart? That word keep in other translations uh, uses the word preserve, meaning to keep it clean, keep it fresh, keep it from going bad. As in the statement, did the milk keep or did it go bad? It's telling us that our hearts can go bad, our hearts can spoil, our hearts can turn on us and become very untrustworthy. And the phrase above all else, the ESV translates it, uh, with all vigilance, meaning watchfulness, attentiveness, guard your heart more than you guard your vehicle with an alarm, more, more than you guard your house with a security system, more than you guard your money by putting it in a fancy bank that has an awesome vault system or some kind of security code that no one else can hack into it, more than you guard these things, guard your heart. Because physically speaking, the heart is one of the most protected vital organs in our body as it pumps uh, blood to and from our limbs in and out of the heart. But we're not just talking about the physical heart this morning. We're talking about the, the, the heart being the emotional lifeline of a person. At the core of who you are, your emotions, your identity, your purpose, your desires, the choices you make and who it makes you are today. That's what we're talking about. You see, your heart is fragile. Your heart is valuable. But your heart is also powerful. So guard it. Lately, uh, Disney and Pixar have been getting a lot of flack lately um, for some of the things that they are producing, some of the content that they're coming out with, um, to the point where a lot of uh, Christian parents are getting frustrated by it, uh, and in turn, uh, revoking a lot of their like Disney Plus subscriptions, they're canceling uh, trips to Disney World, trips to Disneyland. Uh, essentially, what they are doing, what parents are doing, is guarding their kid's heart. Right? And if that's you, I get it. That is awesome. Keep doing it. I, we have young ones at home too, and we have to guard their heart. Have these conversations with them of, of knowing what to filter, what to keep out. But also know this. <laughs> it's a whole lot more than Disney that we have to guard their heart from. It's the tablets and the devices that they're on, the devices in their pocket that many of them have access to the World Wide Web at a click of a button. And it's more than just Disney, and it's more than technology. Uh, a Facebook post I saw the other day, it was a, I'm pretty sure it was a pastor. Uh, it was in the midst of some of this uproar about Disney. And he says this, church, Disney may be coming for your kids, but travel ball took a lot of them a long time ago. Guard their hearts. But I do want to use Pixar as an example real quick because they do a lot of stuff really well. Pixar's really great at evoking emotion, at stirring up emotion and, and, and pulling these feelings from within us when you watch one of their movies. But when you study and research and look into Pixar, it's really interesting that what drives them, their, their driving force, the driving mechanism behind them is them addressing one simple question. And here's the question. What if blank had feelings? That's the driving force into their movies. What if blank had feelings? So let's go on a journey real quick and see what this looks like. In 1995, they asked the question, what if toys had feelings? The answer, Toy Story. In 1998, they asked, what if bugs had feelings? Bugs Life. 
In 2001, they asked, what if monsters had feelings? Monsters, Inc. What if fish had feelings? Finding Nemo. What if cars had feelings? Cars. What if rats had feelings? Ratatouille. What if robots had feelings? <laughs> a little less, uh, less informed. Wally. What if feelings had feelings? The movie Inside Out. The movie Inside Out is depicted of a young girl, Riley, who has five emotions personified inside her. And move, Riley moves away from what is common from her home life, from her friends, and now has to adjust and navigate this life of adolescence. And inside her are fear, joy, disgust, anger, and sadness. And as the plot journeys on, sadness and joy get lost, leaving the other three to navigate her life of adolescence. What you end up seeing is this girl that carries her feelings of life wherever she goes. You get the highs and feeling of great joy, but then you turn around and you see her navigating deep, deep sadness. We've all been there, right? We've experienced that same journey, the great highs and joys of life followed by deep sadness. That's the journey our emotions can take us on. Ultimately, I tell you that to help us understand that this text is conveying that how you feel is powerful. How you feel is powerful. It's so powerful that it takes you places. It carries you somewhere. And that we need to guard our heart because everything in our life flows from it. So what happens if you follow an unguarded heart? For you note takers, point number two is an unguarded heart will lead you astray. Since our heart is where everything flows from, then what we let in is what comes out. It's the age old saying, garbage in, garbage out, right? From your heart is what comes out of your mouth. From your heart is where evil desires come from, like that Mark text I referenced earlier, out of a person's heart comes evil thoughts, and then that old list of other things. And as I mentioned earlier, yes, as parents, we need to be guarding and watching our kids' hearts. But let's be honest, as adults, we've got to do the same, right? For many of us, it is the device in our pocket that is leading many of us astray, that's corrupting our own hearts. In our household, we have a rule, no phones at the dinner table. Here's the kicker. My kids don't have phones. <laughs> Who's that rule for? That rule's for me. Maybe a little bit, Lindsay, but like that rule is 95 to 98% me. And guess what? When I pull out my phone at the dinner table, guess what my kids do? No phone at the table, Dad. They're guarding my heart. They're helping me out. But it's not just our phones, and it's not just Disney. What kind of shows are we watching? What have we binged watch lately? What songs are we listening to? What movies are we watching? Who are we following on social media and on Instagram and on Snapchat? What are the things going into our heart? Are they glorifying? Or are we following an unguarded heart? For me, I love hip hop and rap music. I maybe should have said loved because I loved it more than I do now. Uh, but primarily being is I, I really enjoy dancing. Enjoyed dancing to that kind of music. I in my 1990 Ford Ranger, I had a six and a half inch bazooka tube sitting in the seat right behind me, right? So I'd drive around listening to my rap and my R&B. As I got to college, I was in a fraternity and I didn't drink and I didn't party like that, but I enjoyed going to date parties and functions and those kinds of things simply to have a good time and dance. But as I was also growing in my spiritual walk in that phase of life, I had to wrestle with something. I had to wrestle with, this music probably isn't the best for me, with what I'm filling my heart and my mind with. These lyrics probably aren't the best thing for me to be listening to. Were they glorifying or were they feeding immoral thoughts into my head? Were they making me think dirty things? So I knew something had to change. And I made the switch. Started listening to Christian music. I was now in my Ford Ranger bumping to Christian tunes. But if I'm honest, it mattered. It made a difference. 
no longer were like filthy, nasty things flowing into my mind and thoughts. It was no longer garbage in, garbage out, but my mind was being filled with holy things. Lyrics that were God honoring music that helped fill my heart with the right things. So is the author and wisest man to ever live who wrote the book of Proverbs, is he wrong? Is the creator of the universe that wanted to convey these truths to us through King Solomon, is he wrong? Or are we wrong when we don't listen to them? Are we wrong when we don't heed their warning and heed their advice? Don't follow your heart because an unguarded heart will lead you astray. Which leads us to point number three. Don't follow your heart, inform your heart. I don't know how many of you have ever heard the phrase, the heart wants what the heart wants. I believe there's a uh, Selena Gomez song with that title, but more commonly, some of you might know the phrase quoted from Woody Allen when he was caught having an affair with his stepdaughter. He's quoted with saying, the heart wants what the heart wants. It's as if that was his out, like it was his uh, uh, above reproach type of code. Man, the heart wants what the heart wants. No. The heart wants what it's fed. What are you feeding your heart? What it's taught, what it's told, what it's instructed, what it's shown over time. The heart wants what it's fed. And when we buy into the lie just one more time, I'm just going to do it one more time. You're feeding your heart's appetite like a greyhound dog ready to devour. So what are you feeding? What are you informing your heart with? The wisest man to ever live gives us some instruction in that passage we just read earlier in Proverbs chapter 4. I'm going to read verses 24 through 27 over you guys again, and we'll pull some truths out of it of ways that we can inform our heart. In verse 24, he says, keep your mouth free of perversity. Keep corrupt talk far from your lips. Let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Give careful thought to the paths for your feet and be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. One of the ways you can inform your heart is watch what you say. Watch what comes out of your mouth. It said, keep your mouth free of perversity and corrupt talk. This is a way to guard your heart. Much like Ephesians 4.29 says, don't let any unwholesome talk or corrupt talk come out of your mouth. So church, we've got to watch our talk. And it's more than just cussing, right? Like we've got to watch the gossip, watch the slander, watch the cutting each other down. Watch what you say. In verse 25, he says, let your eyes look straight ahead. Fix your gaze directly before you. Guys, this is a big one. And we've already touched on some of this, right? Like what are you watching be careful of the things you let in, the things you look at that are feeding your heart. Because when we watch inappropriate things, time and time again, we are just spoon feeding our heart. He closes the section by saying in verse 26 and 27, give careful thought. So notice the elements that are at play here. He says, watch your mouth, watch the things you're saying, watch what you're looking at. And now he's saying, be careful how you think. Give careful thought to the patterns of your feet. Be steadfast in all your ways. Do not turn to the right or to the left. Keep your foot from evil. He's saying, be careful of where you go and who you do things with. There's an age-old saying in student ministry, and it probably goes well beyond student ministry, but show me your friends and I'll show you your future. Right? It's kind of the you are who you run with type of statement. If you're hanging out with men and women that are doing the aforementioned activities of not caring about the things that they're talking about, just talking flippantly, if they're not willing to understand the things that are coming out of their mouth or filtering what they're watching and the things that are coming in or that they're putting into their body, then it's no surprise that you too might be on a similar path. His closing statement is keep your foot from evil. If something's evil, stay away from it. Flee. Do not entertain it. Keep your distance. Don't touch. Get away. And there's some things in our world that that's really easy. Like we know things that are blatantly evil. Evil objects, evil lifestyles, evil whatever. Like we can stay away from those. But for some of us, we have a really hard time figuring out what are those other things in my life that are evil? For some of us, it's morally neutral things. It's morally neutral things that we have let take the place of God, that we have let take that number one spot, 
right? There, there's a pastor in the early 2000s, a well-known guy that kind of, I don't know if he coined the phrase or not, but he used it in his sermons that when a good thing becomes a God thing, it becomes a bad thing, right? And that becomes evil. So when that thing takes the place of God, it can still be evil. So inform your heart with what you say, what you look at, and what you think about. So what is it in your life that's causing you to go down the wrong path? What is it in your life that you keep looking at time and time again that you shouldn't? What is it in your life of those people or places that keep encouraging you to speak the way that you're speaking in a negative way? That you don't really care what comes out of your mouth? When you feed your heart more of what it asks for, you end up feeding it less of what it needs. Let me say that again. When you feed your heart more of what it asks for, you end up feeding it less of what it needs. And we can't just remove the bad things from our life. If we're trying to not do these things, we can't just remove them and not replace them with something else, with something good. Any good counselor or therapist will tell you this. Uh, AA groups would tell you this. Celebrate Recovery would tell you this. Like if you are going to remove certain aspects from your life, certain negative attributes, you can't just leave it unvoided. You have to fill it with something else. You have to replace it with something positive. And yes, I'm preaching today, and yes, we're in church, but the question has to be asked, church, what are we filling our hearts with? Are we reading our Bible on a regular basis? Are we spending time in biblical community with other believers? Are we serving anywhere on a regular basis? Are we doing any kind of spiritual disciplines of giving, fasting, worship, scripture memorization? You see, there are no shortcuts and although our society and our culture would want to tell us under, otherwise because we are in an instant gratification, microwave everything kind of society, that you're not just going to wake up tomorrow and be more godly than you are today. You're not going to be more godly this year than you were last year simply by not doing anything. Like you've got to do something. You've got to put in the work. When I first got here to Cedar Ridge, I implemented three rules in our student ministry over there in the building and when we go on trips. It's treat each other with kindness and respect. That's kind of one and two, right? That the, 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 the place, the people, your small group leaders, and even when we would go places, right? If we pop into fast food restaurants or we're going to camp or another facility, like treat their place and their people with kindness and respect. And then rule number three is don't be an idiot. <laughs> Always gets chuckles, even on our junior high trips, right? He just said, don't be an idiot. I'm telling you, if, if our students filter through that lens and ask themselves that question, I'm about to do something. Am I about to be an idiot? Don't do it, right? Like that's your filter. But when I first got here, I had rule number three as rule number one. And someone much wiser than me, my wife said, you should probably want them to be something instead of just not be something. <laughs> Thanks, babe. So rules one and two, treat each other with kindness and respect. Rule three is don't be an idiot. Why? Because you've got to be something. You've got to do something. You've got to fill your hearts with the things it needs versus just not doing something. So inform your heart of the things it needs, not the things it wants. In summary, allow me to challenge you guys with this. Don't follow an unguarded heart. If you do, an unguarded heart will lead you astray. And don't follow your heart until you inform your heart. Let's pray. God, I'm thankful that we can open up your word today and um, be challenged by these scriptures. And as this next series goes on, God, and uh, other ministers present these truths that we wrestle with, is it really biblical? God, I pray that we would be a congregation that's not known just for following our desires and following our heart flippantly, but that we inform our hearts of the things that you want and the things that you desire from our lives and that we can be obedient with our heart, as that Romans 6 passage said. God, I pray this week we would be convicted of these things, that we would challenge ourselves to wrestle with, am I just following my heart loosely and the desires at once, or am I informing my heart of your scripture and your truth and the things that you want from me? In your name I pray, amen.